Thank you. Well, good morning and welcome to the 24th and final meeting of this term of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. And members and the public should turn off their mobile phones, Blackberries and other electronic devices because leaving them in flight mode or playing games on them and things like that um, is not allowed and it could affect the broadcasting system. We have apologies from Jane Baxter today and welcome Claire Baker as her substitute. Welcome to you. Agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private. That is item four related to our work programme. Are members agreed? Thank you very much. And ad agenda item two, um, second item, considers four negative instruments of subordinate legislation as listed on the agenda. I refer members to the paper and note that uh, the uh, Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee have uh, notified us of a couple of these and the government has responded in saying that it will correct minor questions of inconsistency or definitions in the very near future. Any members wish to comment on these? Since you've all read them thoroughly. If not, um, are you content to make no recommendations in relation to those instruments. Agreed? Thank you very much. Right, we'll move to agenda item three on the Land Reform Review Group. And just before we do, um, I would like to uh, tell you that uh, the chairman of the Ascent Crofters uh, buyout, successful buyout, Alan McRae, unfortunately died yesterday. Uh, we're so sorry. Uh, his uh, inspiration and uh, the photograph of him holding the bottle of champagne with his little dog at his feet uh, was an iconic one for that 1992 event that had a huge impact on uh, people's belief that ordinary folk could, as he said, win the land. And uh, it's an appropriate point in our meeting to remember that, and no doubt we'll be hearing more about it in due course. So the third item is to welcome the Land Reform Review Group, uh, Dr. Alison Elliott, the chair, uh, and uh, Robin Callender, recently appointed. Good morning to you both. Um, I wonder whether you wish to make any short opening statement, Alison? Yes, and uh, we, the, the microphones are automatically oh, I see. handled. Fight right, questions. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman, um, and thank you for the invitation to give evidence uh, to this committee. It's coming at a very opportune time. It's uh, halfway through the review which we're conducting. Uh, phase one is behind us, and we always knew that at this stage we were going to have to do a review of the way in which we approach the next part of the, uh, of, of the, the work programme. And we are being in, in, involved in this midterm review uh, over the last couple of weeks. Uh, in trying to shape this up. We didn't realise when we started out we were also going to have to restructure the group. Um, and so that has also been part of this midterm review which we've been conducting. Um, <clears throat> we are... Uh, we have been looking, at, with the support of the government, at expanding the group from three to five, um, and we have now con uh, concluded that and have, as, as the chairman said uh, yesterday, noted that the, we have appointed, um, uh, or the, the government has appointed, a new five people. <coughs> um, this consists of myself as chair. Uh, there are three uh, other members who have extensive um, hands-on experience of this subject, um, we have Ian Cook, who was appointed uh, some time back uh, as uh, the director of DTAS, who has a lot of experience of the urban situation as well as rural questions. We have John Watt, who has a lot of experience of, of Highland and the, um, the work of High and so on. And we have appointed Pip Tabor, who is the project manager for the Southern Uplands Partnership. So I think we get the, the geography um, <laughs> covered in, the, in these three people, as well as a variety of different hands-on skills. But we also, for our fifth person, uh, <coughs> were looking for somebody who would have an overview of the whole subject. Uh, and could direct uh, the, the framework more in which the, this review would be conducted. And we're very fortunate that Robin Callender has agreed to join the group on that basis. He's coming in as a specialist advisor, and so I would uh, in, in, invite Robin through you, Chair, to, to tell us a bit more about what that is. 
Good morning. And um, the committees will be very familiar with the notion of a specialist advisor, whether it's uh, somebody that the committee uses just for technical information or indeed to tackle a big and complicated uh, story in that way. And um, some of you will be aware, as the chairman is aware, that I've... Um, there was 20... Convener, 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 sorry. Um, <coughs> Non-sexist yes. titles. The, um, and um, that uh, I've been involved as special advisor with parliamentary committees for a long time. The first time was 25 years ago. Um, and when you're advisor to a parliamentary committee, you're obviously not on the committee. You're part of the secretariat. But when you have an independent committee of inquiry, um, there is, in a sense, nowhere else to sit um, apart from on the group. And um, the, it's important um, to make the distinction, therefore, as a specialist advisor. The way I sum it up is I have no authority and I have no vote. Um, and in that sense, the other four members of the group are the group members who will make the decision over the terms of the final report. Um, and that my role has been, as Alison alluded to, uh, assist um, with that. And we can say more about um, my role, but people will be familiar that, you know, in terms of how a specialist advisor helps a committee to, in a sense, find their way into big, complicated topics or in developing their framework, developing areas that um, they might like to look at or how to find out particular information. And I'll just make the personal comment um, that, uh, Obviously, when you work for a parliamentary committee, you, you step into a system and you just worry about the topic. When you join an independent inquiry, you also, in a sense, have almost like a clerk-like -like role in, in helping the committee from within the committee. And, um, convener, I, despite going to parliamentary committees for 25 years, this is the first time I've been on this side of the table. Thank you for that. Um, I'd like to home in on uh, what has been a, a kind of pivotal question uh, with regard to the direction which uh, you've chosen to go. Um, your remit from the First Minister suggested to enable more people in rural and urban Scotland to have a stake in the ownership, governance, management and use of land. So uh, you pointed out that, of course, land reform can create winners and losers, but also uh, the uh, existing uh, structure of land has created winners and losers. So at what point and why did the Land Reform Review Group decide to focus uh, specifically on communities? I think in preparation for this meeting, I look back at the, uh, <coughs> the evidence that we gave to the committee in September, and I think that one of the, the themes that was going through that was the emphasis on communities, even at that stage. I mean, the idea of communities as opposed to individuals, I think, is, is, uh, is a contentious issue because, obviously, the um, communities are made up of individuals. We recognise that. Um, the, also, what I was saying to the committee in September was that it was important to to make the subject manageable. I remember, convener, that you started out by saying this subject has been around for a thousand years, and so, <clears throat> you know, within uh, 20 months we weren't going to uh, address everything. And so, in a sense, that was one of the ways in which we were making it manageable by focusing specifically on communities. Um, but going forward, um, we are looking at the wider framework, and uh, so the way in which the material that is relevant to land reform fits into that will, will come, become clearer at that point. So uh, your an aim and focus on community ownership um, is explained by that. You know, when the government set out this remit, has it at any time discussed with you um, this particular focus? I think the, the focus that there was on community ownership um, was something which was historic. I mean, it was the sort of thing which obviously you get into if you're going to be spending a fair bit of the time looking at the 2003 Land Reform Act, because uh, that was the, the bit that was being picked up um, <coughs> uh, in, in, at that point. Um, going forward, however, we, uh, we, as I say, we have been doing a review of the way in which we are going to be uh, developing this uh, going forward. And perhaps Robin would like to, to comment on that at this stage. Thank you. 
Um, I think it is helpful in terms of the committee and their questions. If, uh, if I do take the chance to update the committee, um, you realize I've been appointed very recently. Um, but in the last week, um, there have been um, ongoing, frequent um, discussions between the new members of the group. And as you may be aware, the group met its 13 advisors yesterday. So considerable progress has been made. And as Alison um, alluded, I mean, like a committee, this committee of inquiry had phase one and phase two. And phase one is, is in a sense, the evidence gathering up to the interim report and the feedback, if I might call it that, on the interim report. Um, and phase two is turning to face the final report. And the committee, in a sense, is structuring how it does that. And um, I think um, that uh, you know, in terms of this review, it has looked at process things. And um, so, for example, what, one of the things in that respect is that the, the new group, which or the new members which, who now constitute the group, for example, are very keen to see the submissions that were made to the inquiry made publicly available online as soon as possible. Um, and um, that all, at the moment we're just exploring, you know, that has to go through due process, who said they couldn't go up, checking for deflammatory comments and everything. Um, but in terms of, of looking at the actual substance of the, um, the brief, um, the new group is quite clear that um, taking its remit, it is looking at the broad sweep of what might be considered to constitute land reform issues in Scotland. And um, I'm conscious, Chairman and Convener, in terms of the, the, the debate um, and um, your, your own comments, um, if I paraphrase them from your quoting of Schumacher, um, if, if you look at the land, you see the society. Um, and um, so the group has already um, discussed this in terms of how it's approaching this. And, and so it brings in a number of, of different topics. And so, for example, the, in the interim report, for, for reasons um, you know, at that stage in things, it, for example, identified six work streams. And, and the new group has, in a sense, um, reviewed that, and um, those work streams are, in a sense, off the table, not as topics, but in terms of suggesting that that is all that would be covered. And so, for example, you just at a simple level, um, in terms of reflecting some of my own recent involvement, um, that list didn't include the marine environment. Yet, for many coastal communities and, and many else, um, you well know that there is a major issue there with the management of the seabed and the foreshore. Um, and so in that sense, I think it is um, helpful that the, the group have made clear right at the beginning the scope of their inquiry. And uh, be pleased to elaborate on any aspect of that um, in response to questions. Has this uh, decision about your focus and uh, the specifics been shared with the government up to this point? The, um, we, had a, we had a meeting with uh, the minister <coughs> just, what, 10 days ago, something like that. And at that point, we were talking in terms of having the, uh, of the structure of the group and looking for somebody who would have an overarching view of it. And so to that extent, yes, uh, we haven't been in touch with the government since Robin was appointed. OK, thanks very much. Uh, Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. Um, I'm slightly confused because when the group was initially launched, it had a very wide remit. They made an interim report that made it pretty clear they were focusing on community land issues only. Um, and at the time, there was support from the minister for that position. And now there seems to be a broader remit and there's been additional members come onto the group. Is it accurate to say there's been a relaunch of the group and that actually we're going back to a much broader inquiry and will this time there be a much more strategic approach in terms of the evidence gathering because there was criticism during the first phase that there seemed to be an approach taken off where we're invited we will go and there was a feeling that some voices weren't heard within that wider debate mm -hmm. so in terms of going forward <coughs> can you confirm that this now will again be I know people are going to pick up on tenant farming issues will this now be a wide inclusive review of land reform 
Um, and will there be a much more strategic approach taken in terms of the evidence that is gathered and taken into consideration? Yes, I make a, a point in relationship to that in, in the sense that the, the remit of the group, if you've got it in your briefing pack or anything or gone back to visit it, is, is an extraordinarily wide remit. It is the land of Scotland, which at a certain level in terms of the territory of Scotland with all the different aspects of that, and, and it's about the people of Scotland. And um, so the, the group, in that sense, is going to take a systematic and strategic analysis. And if you think of some of the topics that the group might consider in terms of creating that framework and putting the, the issues within a coherent framework and narrative, and, and um, many of you will perhaps know that the land reform debate um, there are many aspects to it, and it is part of the difficulty of it as a topic that there isn't a clear, coherent framework within which that takes. People come with their issues or a group of issues and everything, and so the group is, is concerned in that way. And um, I think, Convener, that um, you'll be familiar how the position was, for example, with the Crown Estate and the Crown Estate Commissioners, where there was great confusion um, until the Highlands and Islands Councils, in a sense, had their own working group and looked at this and then in a sense it enabled everybody to have a far more focused and structured discussion um, and um, that's why in a sense you know at one level if you think um, that's why I alluded to the marine environment I mean you'll all know that in a sense half of the land of Scotland is under seawater um, and you know the dividing line between the two halves of Scotland in, in a sense is the foreshore um, and that is the land of Scotland. And how that land is controlled, owned, um, and everything is an important question. And uh, land, in that sense, is, is a fundamental crosscut of a society. Thank you. Um, Jim Hume? Yeah, thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning to you, to you both. Um, there's been, as, as you mentioned, uh, six uh, work streams, uh, community en energy, uh, support for new owners regarding building capacity for uh, communities, again, land and a land, uh, potential of a land agency for uh, uh, to um, help communities purchase land, etc. Community engagement with landowners, just to see when there's uh, good examples of that. Land reform in, a, in an ur urban context, which is again about uh, uh, urban community right uh, to buy, and of course crop, uh, the Crofton and Highland experiences, learning from the Highland communities' uh, experiences of uh, Scottish land uh, reform. So it's all, all been a very much a focus on on communities, and I would like to maybe explore a bit more about how the, the uh, land reform review group could help, perhaps individuals and uh, tenant farmers. Uh, there's always been problems with access to land. They're, they're, they're not making it anymore. It's a scarce resource. So I just wonder, within the context of the, the six work uh, streams of the land reform review group, how that might uh, address the issues that we have of tenant farmers, individuals accessing and, and new a entrants accessing uh, uh, land for their uses. Yes, I think when you're talking about the, the six work streams, that is, as has been input into the review which we have just been uh, conducting. And much of the material there will certainly be taken forward, but it will be taken forward in this wider framework uh, of a, a, a comprehensive approach to land reform. And exactly what is going to be in that is something which we are still working on. But I'd like to uh, invite Robin to comment on that. And I can come back to the tenant farmer question. Later. Thank you. And, and I mean, I think as Alison has, has just said, that um, if one starts to think about um, the, the land reform issues, they're not encapsulated in those work streams. And in a sense, it becomes a matter of classification. You know, I gave you three divides in, in, in the sense of physical, legal environments where land reform takes place and, or could take place in, in that sense. And um, that clearly, in a sense, urban issues are important, rural issues are important, but property law is the same in both places. Um, and um, therefore, um, you know, what the group is saying at the moment is that there are actually a much bigger range of topics relating to individuals as well as to, to um, collective and social ownership as well as community ownership. And, and that um, 
in that sense, this involves the, the acquisition of land. And if you think your committee might be construed to deal with land reform on an ongoing basis, you know, if you look at your current work program, not, not just in relationship to, to leased land, whether it's leased by a crofting tenant or an agricultural tenant, um, but issues to do with leased land in a commercial um, and industrial sense. I mean, Scotland has systems of ownership, it has systems of leasing. And um, the convener is well familiar with the questions, for example, to do with the succession in relationship to, to heritable property, where, you know, for example, the Law Commission has pursued this. This is a significant land reform issue, and, and this group would, um, it's quite clear that it would like to be able to describe and explain those issues. And that in some of those issues, there may be, for example, something on the table already. Um, there may be somebody else, for example, something like common good funds, which is being picked up by the um, Parliament and Renewal Bill. And, and so in going through them, the, com the Land Reform Review Group will be going into different issues within this framework to varying levels of detail, depending whether it's receiving attention or not. And if I just give a, an example of um, slightly how the perspective changes um, in the sense that uh, land reform in Scotland should never be confused with the fact that this parliament decided to call the previous legislation in 2003 the Land Reform Act. Um, and if you take a, a, a topic like public access, um, where it's a natural place perhaps to start in looking at public access, whether the um, statutory entrenchment of the existing right um, through the act is, is adequate. Did they get the act right? Is it working? Um, and as you see in, in the interim report, it said, well, the issues seem to be in a sense just down at the implementation thing. But that doesn't mean that there aren't issues that a land reform review group wouldn't address or consider in its inquiry because um, some of you will be aware, for example, about the public rights over the foreshore held in trust by the Crown, which again were covered by the Scottish Law Commission in their 2003 report. And understandably for people at the time of the original legislation, it was debate enough to arrive on what they was achieved without trying to tackle the notion of crime rights in the foreshore when there was considerably less understanding there is now about crime rights in the foreshore. And those rights, for anybody who's not familiar with them, are separated from, um, in Scottish history, the ownership of the foreshore by the crown and the rights over the foreshore held in trust, including access and, and various traditional rights, and became separated. And it's only the ownership right that is reserved at Westminster. And the Law Commission recommended that with the statutory provision over other access rights, it would be logical to clarify the terms of those traditional rights so they don't continue to erode and give them statutory force and link them to the other access. And because local authorities already have powers of bylaws over the foreshore, then there would be scope to fit it in that way. So that, that's just an example, if you see it, I mean, that, that, um, of how the group can pick up extra topics in, in looking at different areas. Okay, uh, uh, if I may convene it, if that's Sorry. all right. Yes, yes. Uh, I thank you for the for the example. But to get back to the the, the core of the question, which it, obviously um, the six uh, work streams perhaps doesn't address this issue directly. But I think uh, Dr. Ellett, you maybe wanting to uh, come back to me or to <laughs> us all here regarding the issue with tenancies, which is obviously probably the easiest way of accessing yes, uh, land, and is maybe has a bit of an there are issues, I think, out there at the moment. Why not? <laughs> Indeed. Um, I think it, the, the question of, of tenancies it does tend to be picked up in, in the context of the question of individual as opposed to uh, community uh, approaches to this. And I think if I could uh, express it this way, there are different ways of approaching the individual issues that are around. Clearly, there are land reform issues which have to do with individuals, and they are issues which are, are about property rights, and they're they at a, a high level, if you like, of, of generality. Um, <clears throat> when we were talking about the individual 
uh, issues with tenants. This had to do with the kind of evidence that we heard from tenants um, where there were individual issues with, between them and the landowner or the land, land, landlord or the factor. Now, that's a very different kind of individual issue. As lis listening to them, we were, we were trying to hear for uh, something about solutions which would be appropriate at a, at a general level rather than the specifics of a particular complaint. So when I'm talking about saying that the, you know, it was getting to the individual level, it was at that in level of an individual complaint, which was very difficult for us to see how we as a, as a group could attend to that. The, uh, and we didn't hear much at the level of generality from the tenants that we spoke to other than the absolute right to buy, which was a, a different kind of issue. So, so that, when you're talking about individual, there, there, was a, there was a level of individuality about the kind of evidence that we were getting, which was not helpful for the group as a whole. Does that help? Yeah, that, that, that helps slightly, but if, it, if we can still explore it uh, a little bit further. I mean, there are some tenants that exist at, at the moment have, have the luxury, I suppose, because they actually have their, their tendency, but at the moment, uh, um, it, it does look like there's not so much uh, land being let out. There is more land being farmed in hand. There is, a, I think, probably a concern from some of the landlords about the absolute right to buy, so therefore per, they're, perhaps they're not letting land, uh, and there's a bit of a lack of a, a trust, which maybe goes back to 10 years or, or so. So it's maybe in your deliberations and uh, in your research, was there much evidence or of of that where you know individuals were coming forward saying we just can't access land we can't get it we can't get get a tenancy the tenancies aren't being offered which seems to be the case in at least my view anyway as i say i think the the men, most of the evidence the, the evidence that we were listening to that was relevant to that was uh, was of individual cases of individual complaints it was not and as I say, I didn't see how we could take that bit forward. Uh, the, one of the ways in which there were concerns were, had to do with issues which were already being dealt with elsewhere. And the, that included things to do with the, the conduct of rent reviews. We heard a lot about that. Uh, we heard also about assignation of tenancy, that being a, an, another issue which w could have been a general one to pick up. But these were ones which were being dealt with elsewhere, and that's why we uh, said that there was that if they were being dealt with by the Tenant Farming Forum, then that was where we it was appropriate for them to be dealt with. Thanks. Thanks. Mike Ferguson, then Claudia Beamish, then Graham Day. Thank you, convener, and I wonder. Good morning. Uh, both of you. Um, I just wonder if I could seek a little further clarity on this issue, because if I've got this right, you, you purposefully uh, you took a step back from looking at some of these um, sensitive areas, I, in my view, quite rightly, because they were being looked at uh, by other forums, particularly the Tenant Farming Forum. And um, what I have not quite picked up from you is, uh, particularly in terms of the review that you, you, you're, you're currently undertaking, is what your future intentions are in that regard. And I'm very aware that the um, STFA, the Scottish Tenant Farmers Association, uh, in the wake of the Cabinet Secretary's announcement last week about, right to buy, about an absolute right to buy, um, have actually suggested that you should be looking at this again uh, in order to try to bridge the time gap that will now exist between now and when the, the Cabinet Secretary's review comes into being next year. And I just wonder if you could clarify your intentions on that, on the specific issue of landlord-tenant relationships. I understand um, that they have suggested that the general issue of, ten, of, of tenure uh, is something which should be looked at in general, and that is what we're continuing to... That, that will be part of the overarching framework that we're developing, but I'll let Robin uh, pick that one up. Uh, thank you. And, and the... If one's taking a systematic approach to land reform, then the, the issues of leased land, be it crofting tenure or agricultural tenants, are clearly in the frame. I and mean, we all know it's a long-standing issue with a, with a long history. Um, and it is clearly part of the framework and part of the issues that this group is looking at. Um, the question, not just with this issue, but with some of the other issues, and if I just first, you know, I mentioned common good funds, which is an important issue. Um, in, in that, it's a collective issue, obviously, but that is now being looked at in, in the Empowerment and Renewable Bill. So in an issue like that, this, this review group will monitor that 
It has discussions there. It will see what comes into the draft bill. And if it feels from its perspective and analysis that there are shortcomings or points, it, it, it will try to bring these to the fore. Or if, for example, um, you have another piece of legislation that came, came forward, for example, and the group felt that, okay, well, that might have um, addressed that, but there's still a big question in that area. It could apply to, in a sense, tidying up aspects of community right to buy. Are there still bigger issues that it's not pragmatic to incorporate at, at this stage? And similarly with the agricultural tenancy situation, you know, there is a debate going on between the parties who are involved. There's the prospect that they're all going to get around the table with all that they need to discuss. And therefore, this group really can only effectively, at the moment, watch developments. But it will, that will be a, you know, be it a heading or a subheading or whatever the group might decide, but it will be there, is my understanding. OK, thank you for that. Well, dear Beamish. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, could I just push you both a little further on the question of tenancy? Um, I attended the Dumfries meeting, um, which was a very free-flowing discussion and, and helpful, I think. Um, but tenants who I represent in South Scotland have expressed concern about feeling excluded from the process now. And you're talking about um, the possibility of a wider remit. And in view of the points that um, uh, my colleague Alex Ferguson has highlighted about um, Richard Lockhead's announcement about absolute right to buy and the possibilities, which have been interpreted by the Scottish Tenant Farmers um, Association as um, that that is back on the table. Now, we perhaps don't need to have that debate here about exactly what was said or whatever. But I, I do feel quite strongly that it's important in view of your wider remit um, that you're discussing beyond the six, um, the, the six work streams that um, that tenant farmers should not be excluded from the, the possibility of um, con consideration of their views on absolute right to buy, which is a different, which, not a different thing, but it is specifically about, as, as I'm sure you'll agree, about land reform. And it's not about what the um, Tenant Farmers Forum is looking at, which is about specifically about tenancy. So I make that point um, and ask for your response to that, please. Now, can I ask about your, your, your tenants' um, concerns? Did they feel that, um, that their, their views were not listened to at the time of data collection? Uh, not or that they were no. not, that the decision of the group was not the one that they wished to come out? Uh, it, not that their views weren't listened to at the time. And I made okay. the point about John Fries and, mm -hmm. and, 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 but, but that, that, they now um, feel a sense of exclusion that, you know, it was, a, it was a difficult winter and as has been reflected to me by a small number of tenants, but I, I want to highlight the point, um, and that they gave up their time to come or they gave up their time to make submissions, some of whom were in a difficult situation and asked for them to be made anonymously as well. And, and that now uh, they feel a sense of marginalisation from, from the land reform issue. And, and I think that's as much as I can say. Yes. Um, well, I mean, the, as I say, we did listen to, to tenant farmers in various fora and in various contexts, um, and we did get submissions from them. And our, the way we handled it was the way we handled it. Um, and that, I think, is now in the past. The question of, in the, in the future, how we will handle this, I think, as, as Robin has said, it is something which will be... Um, will be picked up or will be monitored as we are going forward. Um, the question of whether we are going to be able to take a lot of evidence again in the second phase um, is, is something which is up for discussion. If I could just elaborate, I, I, I think that one of the important distinctions um, from the committee, it, it's a big remit if you're going to do it justice. It's a challenging project. Um, against that scale, time might be seen as short in terms of, of delivering. And that the committee in going forward, it's not sort of withdrawing into a, a bunker, if you see what I mean, but the committee in developing its analysis and the issues and the frameworks that it's addressing will want to go to speak with various people about various things to find out what it needs to know to understand particular things more closely. 
but more at a, a at a generic level rather than the individual level. Um, so if on any front, if you see it, I mean, the, the group has got to, um, the group will be doing quite a lot of just simple fact findings. Their report needs to have information in it rather than just opinions in it upon which to base their analysis. So that's going on. There will be, you know, one will go and perhaps see the Law Commission, one will go and see other people on different topics. Um, so, I mean, it is very definitely in the frame. I mean, it is a prominent land reform issue in Scotland. Uh, the committee would not ignore that. The tenancy issue. Yeah. Thank you. Can I just um, wrap this section up by making a couple of points? Um, since uh, the discussion has moved up the agenda and that the um, Cabinet Secretary is setting up a review uh, of the tenancy issue, etc., that will carry quite a stream of work with it. But the tenant farmers are suggesting that indeed, you know, a radical move like the absolute right to buy should not be carried out in isolation, but must be considered in the context of a land reform agenda uh, in a note to us. Um, you say that you'll keep a wary eye for, for, for what develops. It may well be that it's reports before your final report. So therefore, would you uh, comment on that subject at that time? Convener, yeah. the, the, I don't think that issue just applies to the issue of agricultural tenancies in the sense that um, people will be familiar with the committee where, in a sense, topics related to land reform, many of which, are, you know, I mean, it has that political sort of sound to it, but I mean, We've just had the Land Registration Act. I mean, this is, act, this is land reform, if you see it. I mean, it's an ongoing process. You have the aquaculture and fisheries bills dealing with district salmon boards. This is, this is relating to rights and interests and, and, and land reform in that sense. And one of the features of, of the land reform debate, which I pay, uh, I acknowledge the convener's long-standing involvement and great knowledge on these things, is it goes up and down. And that's not helpful, if you see it, I mean. And, and that the, the problem is that, you know, you remember that the Law and Reform Policy Group set up under Lord Sewell started to provide a, a, the wider strategic analysis, the way it, you know, broke up the topics, law reform all, all the way through, and it set out the stages. And then the group is disbanded. The officials work through the boxes until there is none left. And we wait again until issues arise conspicuously enough before somebody sets something up. And we have, as a society in Scotland, we have bodies like the Lands Tribunal, the, the Scottish Law Commission, but we don't have a body that maintains, you know, like a land commission or whatever you might call it, that maintains a, a, a focus. And certainly this group has had discussions about that concern in, this, in the sense that the, this group's, um, in a sense, appointment, its report run to 2014, and therefore you have a group which puts a report out and then goes home. Can I half of that sentence, because uh, Tim, just before you, you do, because it goes on to suggest that the STFA believes that the Scottish Government must undertake a study of Scotland's land tenure structure as a matter of urgency by either burdening the Land Reform Review Group's remit or setting up a land commission. And uh, the point is made, I think, that you see your limited time, limited area, um, your final thought on that just now. Thank you, yes. I mean, I think it has been very refreshing and helpful for me to have this new perspective uh, from the, uh, since, since Robin has been engaged with the group and then since we have moved the group into a, a team of five people. Um, because the, the issue has always been how do you cope with a huge topic and a huge remit and the way in which we, we dealt with it, first of all, when we had three people, um, was to make it manageable in one particular way. 
Uh, at the end of that, and in the last few couple of months, I mean, people have been saying, oh, you're not looking at this and you're not looking at that. And that becomes a bit of a shopping list, which is not very helpful and is not a, a coherent way of, of progressing. Um, the, what we are offering and what we are hoping to develop will be a coherent narrative which will then allow us to say when somebody says, well, why don't you pick up such and such and such and such, then we will be able to see how that fits into the, the a coherent story. And I think that's going to be helpful going forward. Well, we look forward to that. I, I just have to say one final thing, because it was raised with us. Um, when we first took evidence from tenant farmers uh, two years ago, uh, we did so on the basis of uh, redacting much of the contact detail from the submissions we had because they weren't directly relevant to the Agricultural Holdings Bill <coughs> at that time, but they were deep concerns. Now, concerns have been expressed by some tenants who attended public meetings and stated their views that they are now exposed uh, with regards uh, their landlords and their agents uh, in some places. And also that the uncertainty amongst tenant farmers has increased because of the Munsey and Salveson judgments, as I mentioned in a question yesterday. Um, uh, when you're in a process question, first of all, making sure that uh, if people do wish to keep their evidence um, private, that that can happen. But can you reassure people who gave public evidence, oral evidence, at public meetings that uh, that will be acknowledged and indeed, in a sense, backed with uh, the force of the committee to sort of say there should be no um, comeuppance in people. I do recall that when the Crofters Commission met in 1883, uh, the witnesses were assured that there would be no retribution from the landlords. Can we be assured of that today? Yeah, I mean, the oral evidence which we took from tenant farmers um, in in some cases, was was entirely entirely private. I mean, there was nobody else there other than people from the committee. Um, in in some cases, it was a closed meeting, um, in which there was nobody else there other than the members of the committee. Some tenant farmers, as in the Dumfries case, uh, were in a public meeting and they were very ca careful, in, I assume, in terms of what they said. And they knew that it was a public meeting and they knew that. Uh, we are very conscious of this issue uh, and we are very careful not to uh, make public something which would be damaging to people. Well, the sensitivity is uh, Absolutely. worth noting. Yeah, indeed. We, we recognise that. Um, a brief question on the uh, focus at the moment. Um, uh, did Alec Ferguson wish to ask anything? Yes, I, I, I certainly... A lot of the subject area that I wanted to cover um, has already been covered in this in this opening discussion. But I just wonder if I could sort of press you a little bit further on, on the the um, the work streams and the slightly expanded role. The, 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 I mean, you've already explained you're no longer sort of fixed on these six work streams, but Marine is going to come into it and, and a generally a slightly broader approach will be taken. But uh, And... You, you've mentioned the huge brief that you've got, which is the huge remit, which is absolutely right, and also the limited timescale. And I just wondered if you could perhaps... I mean, are, are you happy that you, with the expansion of the group to five, um, uh, have, you now, have you got the skills and the resources, or at least access to the skills and resources, that you need to deliver a substantive report in the timescale that you've been given? I certainly hope so. We have we have the five people uh, who are because we've got five, then we can differentiate roles better, and that I think is going to be helpful going forward. Um, <clears throat> we have also our team of thirteen advisors who are, uh, you know, make openings into into other networks and so on, as well as the very good advice which they give us themselves. We had an excellent meeting yesterday in, in Inverness with them, and uh, things were moving forward well on that. Um, we. I can't. Im I'm, I'm not looking for for, for extra. We're we're also going to um, to to commission papers um, from from people, and um, I feel that we have access to as much information as we can use. But maybe Robin's got different perspective on that. I, the answer is that um, the group is going for that. We feel that there is access to people. As a specialist advisor, I see it as a daunting challenge, um, but one well worth going for. 
just in light of, of, of the meeting yesterday and, and the review that you've had, are you able to um, enlighten us at all on how you intend to take the process forward from this point? I mean, uh, once again, please. Maybe too early in your review to do that. But. Um, it's too early to say much, and and um, it, obviously the the group has signalled before that it's very pleased and happy to come back to this committee at at, at any time, um, and that. I think what the group's keen to do at the moment is, is that we could make a list of six topics into a list of 20 topics, which indeed we did in the sort of confidentiality of our own discussions, if you see it. I mean, but it could actually be 40 topics, depending how you structure it. Um, and therefore, if you see it, I'm being slightly hesitant, but if you take it as a systematic look, you know, land is property. There are big issues about property in urban Scotland, vacant and derelict land, housing and everything. Uh, we have access to people you know, who know more about that than, than um, the members of the group themselves, but the group is very keen to put that into a coherent framework that identifies and flags up issues. Um, as I said at the beginning, some issues it will be able to pursue down to a level of detail and it's going to as you all know, land reform, in a sense, isn't just about the property rights. It's about also the support that goes in conjunction with the delivery of any reformed system. And therefore, the question of support, in particular for communities, um, will be a, a, another key aspect of it in that way. Well, thank you very much for that. Perhaps I could just take the liberty, convener, of, of suggesting that it would, once you have identified the framework and the process that you did, it, it might be useful if we were made aware of that process, if you're able to, to, so. to let us know. I think that would be very useful. But thank you for that. Thank you. Um, Claire, Baker, any question yes. from your Thank perspective you, yeah. just now on this? Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I would support Alex Ferguson's comments. This morning has been quite enlightening in terms of the broader remit of the group, and it would be helpful for members and other interested um, people to have a clearer idea of what direction the group is going in. Um, I did want to ask a question about community ownership. I mean, we know that Scotland's land patterns, you know, we have um, 16 people owning 10% of the land, 432 people owning 50% of the land. And when the group set out, there was an aim in there to increase diversification and to challenge some of these numbers. Um, so far, community ownership has been seen as the main vehicle for that. I mean, how do you see community ownership achieving that? And how do you also intend to address ownership around whether it's forestry or farming or other types of land? I mean, is diversification still an aim of the group? I can't see how it shouldn't be. I mean, it will be, yes. Um, can, but can, can I elaborate slightly? The, um, one, one of the things that, that the community will be conscious of is that when one says community ownership, actually what do we mean? What is a community? You know, is a community as a community is defined in one piece of legislation? Um, and, you know, the focus at that level is, is on local communities, neighbourhood communities, but there's clearly another level of community at the level of local authority, for example, where communities own assets together at, at that level and so um, but when you look at the local level um, I think it's important to see community ownership for example it's not it's not community ownership uh, where for example I mean where I come from and there's a community business everybody on the electoral roll automatically gets a vote and they vote in five local people who run it on behalf of the community that that to me is a, is a community business inclusive democratic and everything. Now, if you get a situation where um, you get people within a location or community um, set up an organization maybe to promote the common good, but actually you have to pay a subscription to join it, it becomes, does it become some kind of club? Because it's excluding people who don't, you know. So you have to be clear about what authority, if, we, if society decides that it wants to adjust the balance, for example, by local authority, asset transfers or anything. Um, it's important to see community ownership as part of social ownership. And there are a wide range of social ownerships that might not fall into definitions. And one that the committee will be, um, for example, familiar with, which has come up time and time again, um, and that I know the convener takes an interest in, is trust ports, which are very fascinating, long-standing social institution um, 
of harbours in particular towns. Um, so the committee will be trying to provide this analysis um, because obviously there are many aspects of our society now. I mean, you know, where you get a, a broad local community buys its football club. You know, that's a form of social ownership. So we need to set things in context. But secondly, um, when we talk about community ownership, and for example, now in a sense, there's, there's the notion of a target for the area of community ownership. How is it being defined in relationship to that? And what is, how is it being measured? And so we hope to approach all these topics in a systematic way, providing a robust and factually sound analysis. And will you also be looking at the issue of, you talk about definition of community, whether it's community of location or community of interest, or will the group be considered in a kind of broader understanding of what community can mean? You talk about societal ownership, but there's also debate around how you define a community. Sure. Yes, but, but in terms of, of looking at, um, clearly the, 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 this inquiry has a public interest brief. And, and so it's looking at levels of public interest rather than, for example, I mean, some would define an N, certain types of NGOs as a community of interest. Now, they're obviously a legitimate property owner, or, but it wouldn't necessarily be construed as, as social or community ownership um, in that sense. Thank you. Thank you. We'll get more chances, no doubt, as we go through. <coughs> Claudia Beamish has a supplementary in that one. Convener, it's actually a supplementary on um, Alex Ferguson's question about the work streams, if that's appropriate at the moment, about yeah, the sure. land agency. Yeah, let's deal with the process issues. There's another process issue just so, after this, so please right, do. Thank you. Hmm? <laughs> um, I, I was interested to see that in the work streams that you've highlighted the possibility, possibility of a land agency and would just like to seek some clarification sure. because I feel a little bit confused about it in relation to... Um, the context, um, this, uh, and, and, and I quote from your interim report, um, it seems to put the context as appearing to compare this approach to the other, and I quote, proposals coming from the corpus of the submissions and evidence gathered during the group's visits, and that the interim report reveals some attractions to the idea of better planning and liaison between landowners and communities. Could I just understand, uh, if you can help me with this, um, whether you see the better planning and consultation as an alternative to possible arrangements for a land agency with appropriate powers, or are these complementary matters? Um, I think that the, the question of, of the land agent, the, what was being discussed in the interim report at that point was, are we dealing with, with one idea here, or are we dealing with a whole range of different ways of, uh, of approaching things which have all come up with a similar kind of title? Because the phrase land agency came up in many different contexts within the, the submissions that we had, and it meant different things in different contexts. But that doesn't mean to say that there wasn't a, a, an overarching issue uh, and, and concept that was behind it all. And so part of the, uh, the differentiation will have to be to, you know, to, to, to clarify just what these different uh, ideas were. As, as always, the question of, uh, of how that fits in will, will depend on the overarching framework and, and the way in which we are, the perspective we're taking on the, on the overall picture. Um, land agency is, is, a, is, a, is a, a, an idea that is being picked up as well by other organisations uh, taking that one forward and so I, I can't see it not being part of what we're going to be looking at but whether it comes out as you know, a topic that is land agency or whether it is a topic which is incorporated in other, uh, in other, other kinds of topics I, it is too early to say. Robin? Could I just add that I mean, the committee would be familiar with, with the um, the appreciation that there was in, in many communities um, for the community land unit that was part of High and the, the original relationship between that unit and, and the Scottish Land Fund. Um, and um, I'm sure many of the, the committee members and, and uh, the convener will know how the Highlands came to be defined by the particular boundary because I live just on the other side of it um, in a Highland environment but not part of that environment and therefore our community doesn't get access to that. And there is, for example, a long-standing issue that comes up in a range of contexts. Um, you know, there was an attempt to set up a Scottish Enterprise community land unit. It flickered briefly and then disappeared. 
Um, you'll be aware of the issue of the lack of a social remit in, in that context. But as Alison uh, alludes, this, this is a part of a wider, um, in a sense, how do you support? And I'll just supplement that um, because perhaps um, some may remember that one of the things around the time of Lord Sewell's inquiry was at that point um, he instructed various public bodies or parts of government to come up with a sort of code of conduct, if I can say it, in, in terms of how they engaged and dealt with communities and, and um, indeed um, had debates with the Crown Estate Commissioners before they indeed also adopted that. And so there's an example, if you see it, I mean, of, of a, at that time a constructive thing that helped the relationship with communities. Thank you. Um, Graham Day, another process issue. Yes, yeah. uh, thank you. Good morning. Uh, moving forward, how in practice will you engage with ministers? Will you be updating them on the direction of travel, or will it be a case of getting on with the work and engaging with ministers only as you move into phase three, or indeed when you present your final report? A, a meeting with the minister uh, in September. Um, we have, uh, and and the intention is that uh, we would be having regular meetings, but but not. I, it's not clear exactly yet how frequently they would be. Um, the the minister has been uh, very good at um, giving us our independence, at, at making sure that we are supported, but that he's not directing the way in which we're thinking. And I hope that that would continue going forward. Um, at the point we when we get to the. The, the draft final report at the end, when we get to the end of <coughs> December, beginning of January, um, <coughs> the intention is that we would then basically give a heads up to ministers on, on where we're going to be going with the draft of the, the final report. Thank you. Excellent. Right, so on some issues now um, that you picked up along the way. Um, what evidence has the Landform Review Group uh, heard on uh, current models of taxation? land taxation? <clears throat> um, within the, the submissions, there were, um, I, I mean, I've got the, the, the ODS report, tell, I can't remember how many, how many there were, um, there were comments on land value taxation. <clears throat> um, and that was partly because the, um, the call for evidence had identified a list of suggested questions which people might want to pick up. Um, I think, unfortunately, an awful lot of people took that as being the, the framework for the set of questions they were expected to answer, which was not the intention of it. And so we got a lot of questions on that. Um, and, a lo and it was also um, pretty evident, looking at some of the, the responses, that there was a variety of different interpretations of what land value taxation actually was. We didn't have discussions or um, overtures to us um, about taxation or about land value taxation in, in particular, other than what came in the submissions. So we didn't have discussions with people. We didn't have meetings with people that were raising that rather than the, apart from the ones that were in the submissions. Well, I'm aware of the major evidence from the Scottish land and the states who are opposed to any thought of this, but also are aware of um, the discussions that the Green Party had recently uh, with regard to land value tax. Now, um, in the Sewell uh, period, they said requires further study. Uh, that phrase um, obviously was pertinent 10 years ago and more. It surely couldn't be pertinent now. So therefore, will you actually look at uh, some model of uh, this matter in your report? It's looking ahead to how it would fit into the framework um, that will be, be, be developed. Robin, I, may have I was just ideas. going to comment that, um, I mean, I'd said earlier about um, when you come to an independent committee, you know, one of the lacks is, the, you know, the process is not as smooth with the parliamentary committee. But um, one of the greater flexibilities you have in an independent committee of inquiry is that um, one is not so constrained by the evidence in terms of you... The committee is at the stage where it will go and investigate. The committee is at the stage where it, where there are gaps in the evidence or issues have been raised, and we need to, the group needs to investigate topics. Um, then these will all be things that are pursued at this stage, which is why the group um, is very keen 
immediately to identify a range of people it needs to speak to about a range of issues to inform the committee properly. Okay, we'll look forward to hearing from you in that, uh, in that area. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Convener. Um, could I ask you both um, if you'd like to comment on the extent to which human rights and ECHR have been taken into account to date, and how might public interest be demonstrated in terms of future land reform? You have covered the, the, the second part of the question to some degree, but in any further comments? I mean, I think that the, the, this, was, this was a very uh, refreshing perspective which we picked up uh, early on, and in February we had a, <coughs> a, 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 a meeting and a public meeting uh, in the part of the gathering in Glasgow which was looking at land reform and human rights, and we have been in touch with Alan Miller uh, right since, since November on this, because we recognise that human rights is a, an issue which comes through uh, a variety of different approaches to, to, uh, to land and, and to communities. You have the ECHR, but you also have the UN Convention on Economic, uh, Cultural and Social Rights. Uh, which are all relevant to this, to aspects of this issue, uh, and so certainly that will be something that we will want to to pursue and and not lose sight of as we're going forward. Um, the, in some ways, human rights and and um, public interest are two sides of the same coin. And uh, I, I mean, I, I would agree with that, and and I think human rights. Um, it is also interesting in the context of property and land the dialogue between the, um, the Commission and the Land Reform Group as to where they see it sitting in their national action plan um, is a constructive area of debate. Let's come back briefly, Convener. Um, you, you'll both, of course, be aware of the Salveson Riddle case um, and, and what that ruling was. And, um, and I know that um, yourself, Alison, and, and our Convener were both at Community Land Scotland's um, conference, I believe, uh, where Professor Alan Miller did speak, as I understand it, about um, the fact that um, ECHR shouldn't be seen, in his view, as a red card um, to land reform and to community ownership um, and the possible um, right to buy tenants or, or any of those issues. And, um, and I just wanted to highlight that point and, and ask if you, either of you had any comments on that, because I do think it's important in view of the... The, the recent, um, you know, the recent court rulings, perhaps. Indeed, it, it is. It, that is something which we've been aware of right from the start. That that the ECHR has this dimension of the public interest in it, which is, and, and which, and and Alan is is very alert to the the sort of trends within the the European courts on how that is developing and he, he is uh, saying that it is something where where the the public interest dimension of it is something which has to be it, which is becoming more and more important going forward and um, in, in terms of the, the challenge of defining the the public interest obviously that is something you have to define in particular contexts um, but it would seem to me that, as I said before, the, the remit of, of this group is, is a public interest remit. And therefore, in everywhere it goes in terms of, if you imagine this list of topics or however it's structured and one's making a recommendation, it may be unrelated to human rights issues, but you need to say what is the public interest if you're going to make that change. And there may be things where one feels that um, the group members might feel, well, the Perhaps there should be change in an area, but actually, do you have the information? Do you have the facts to be able to substantiate what the public interest is? So we'll certainly be looking at this. Thank you. OK. Um, next question, uh, Graham Day. Uh, thank you. C can I ask what evidence the group has heard on common good as a, a type of ownership, and what specific additional work will be you, you be carrying out in this area during phase two? There wasn't much reference to common good in the in the evidence that we got. Um, there was some uh, from particular quarters, uh, and there is a wider interest in it. Again, Robin is, is familiar with that as well. And um, so you're aware that this is um, in the empowerment mm -hmm. um, and renewal bid, so that um, as a specialist advisor, um, f fresh on the spot, so to speak, um, I'm due to go and catch up with that. Um, and uh, it will be something that this group will monitor and be involved in dialogue with. Um, 
as an issue that, in a sense, is, is being dealt with. Um, and we will, the group will evaluate how, whether it feels that you know, it's got further comments to make on it. Right, thank you. Uh, Claire Baker. Um, I suppose really it's a process question. We do have a number of things going on at the same time. The Land Reform Review Group, Tenant Farmers Forum, um, there's going to be another review on tenancies, and then you've got the Community Power and Renewal Bill. Um, how are these things going to come together to be I coherent? I think that all those things in one way or the other relate to the property system. The property system is a coherent system. And that is the framework. It's about land. Land is property. And what I was alluding to earlier is one advantage or one benefit, in a sense, of, of looking at the picture in the round is to relate all those things. You know, because I was adding, well, you know, we've got rural affairs looking at the agriculture and fisheries bill. We've got you looking at this. Um, and if this group can bring that into a coherent framework, um, and say where on each issue things are or point where they should go or say how they should change depending on, on the different issues and the, the levels that the different issues are taken to depending um, on when somebody... That's the framework. And, and the role of the, of the Land Reform Review Group? To if the to Land Reform Review Group... Come together, yeah. Yes, and if the Land Refu Reform Review Group is going to make sense of its own remit, mm -hmm. It needs to do that. I think there is also the timing question, which is another matter um, of, of this going forward, uh, you know, in, in parallel with other, other processes. And we are very closely involved with the Community Empowerment and Renewal Bill team in terms of, you know, clearing, clearing lines with that. Okay. Right. Um, move on to our favourite topics, Angus MacDonald. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Um, good morning, Dr. Elliott. Uh, good morning, Mr. Calder. Um, uh, Dr. Elliott, uh, at, at the recent CLS conference on, on Sky, um, you stated that you aim to commission further research on the Crown Estate. Um, and there's been some mention of the Crown Estate already this morning. Um, what engagement has the group had with the Crown Estate to date, and uh, what role uh, could the Crown Estate land play in future reform? The, the the engagement we've had so far is that we have received a submission from the Crown Estate to our, our call for evidence, and we have um, <coughs> we have discussed that when we visited Highland Council, for example, and also when we visited Golson. So the, the issue of the Crown Estate came up in these two visits. But uh, we have here with us now someone who knows more about the Crown Estate, I suspect, than anybody else in this room, with um, due respect. If, if I can comment in, in terms of um, the range of topics in, in, in front of the group. Um, th this one's an interesting one in the, in, in the sense that is one of those topics where there is a substantial volume of existing evidence. You've taken evidence as a committee. It's been in the Treasury Committee. It's been in the Scotland Bill Committee. It's been in the Scottish Affairs Committee. Um, so the group has the advantage of being able to have all, all this information available to it in, in its analysis. And um, members of the committee will perhaps recall that um, both in the Scotland Bill Committee, it was one of the consensus issues to, to move the situation with the Crown Estate. And again, it was a consensus issue um, in terms of the Scottish Affairs Committee at Westminster. Um, so the committee does have some advantage in the sense that I've read all the evidence already. Helpful. Um, we do have the county state coming to committee in September, um, so we'll certainly, and, and including the commissioner, so we'll certainly yeah, raise the issue with them. Um, I was just intrigued by your comment about Golson. Um, in what way was the county state connected to the Golson uh, situation? This was in, in connection with the, um, the, the the development of uh, wave energy, right. just off the off the shore. But I think, it's a, as perhaps you're hinting, I mean the. In, if one was to look at the impact of different types of land reform measures, measures to do with the Crown Estate are one of the most conspicuous, you know, it's a, a topic of which there seems to have been a widespread consensus, and it, it is a topic that could immediately make a huge difference to a lot of coastal communities and, and other people. Um, and. Um, is therefore a profoundly important topic within the whole scheme of things. 
Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, turning to the issue about post-legislative scrutiny and uh, the difficulties that there are that have arisen through the um, imperfections, shall we say, in various aspects of the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003, mm -hmm. uh, I think about the difficulties that the people in Park have in, in a hostile bid there, which has ended up in the court for years. Um, that we need to wonder about people's capacity and people's ability to actually achieve their goals. So, as a first part of this question, you know, there seem to be few uh, mainland crofting communities that have bought land. Um, uh, what can be learned from the experiences of the park community about the provisions of Part 3 of the Land Reform Act and how would your group see ways of changing that? Um, we have crofters on our, amongst our advisors, and so this will be something which will be taken forward as we're, as we're going on, and we will be discussing that with them. Um, the, the question of why a community doesn't pick up an opportunity um, is varied. And, uh, um, uh, we've had discussion uh, about places where, where um, that might have happened, but but didn't. Um, and in, in particular, but there's all, I mean, this is not crofting communities, but the, um, we have been speaking to our, our new member, Pip Tabor, from the Southern Uplands Partnership, about that question in the south of Scotland and the, the question of what opportunities are available, how much knowledge there is about it, and so on. Um, so that the the question of, of whether communities pick it up is is, is an issue. Um, the the difficulties with the the legislation are, are are very obvious, but the what is interesting I think about it as well is the way in which the legislation has um, performed a function of bringing people to the table in ways which they wouldn't have done elsewhere uh, otherwise. Uh, now how you say they wouldn't have ha this wouldn't have happened otherwise is uh, is difficult to pin down but certainly there's a lot of um, belief that there have been other things have happened and other um, uh, communities have bought land uh, because of the existence of the legislation though not through it <coughs> um, and so that makes it difficult to do the post legislative scrutiny that you're talking about um, leaving aside the the south of scotland and the, the bulk of scotland that i'm just on the crofting communities have you got any sense about their because that's the next question um just leaving them aside for the second <laughs> and as the sole member for the highlands here <laughs> um you know i i was interested in you know people's uh, confidence and capabilities mm -hmm. and whether that's something that's crossed your path uh, in terms of uh, your remarks that you've uh, drawn on so far and that you might indeed uh, build upon. So you, you're asking about the, the, the confidence and, and capacity within crofting communities. Yes. yes. Um, because the mainland seems to be very much bereft of uh, uh -huh. major movements towards it, well, that is something we haven't looked at, the question of what is happening on the, on the mainland. Uh, when you look at some of the crofting communities on the Western Isles, which is where we, we, we've met many people, um, then the capacity definitely seems to be there and the, uh, and, and the, and the enthusiasm as well. So, so it shouldn't be missing? I shouldn't, oh, no. I, no. I think, I think there, are, there are assets and, and uh, capabilities in people that they don't know are there until the opportunity arises. So now that the rest of the committee has woken up, um, I'll ask Claudia to ask the question next. <laughs> Thank you. <for> the <laughs> <laughs> uh, building on our convener's question um, about confidence and capabilities, uh, I, I'm, I would ask you whether maybe awareness is another important factor in relation to communities and the possibilities of community ownership. Uh, how, given that much of rural Scotland, not just South Scotland and not just Highlands, um, is neither under crofting tenure nor well populated, um, are there, how will viable communities with an appetite for collective acquisition be encouraged to buy land and indeed support it? Well, if I could answer that. Robinson and, example. Um, I think some committee members be aware I'm involved in West Community Trust, which was the first community ever visited by this committee when it left the parliament um, and has been going 
long and, and is in Deeside and um, has acquired significant amounts of land. But if you draw a spectra, a line from us, in a sense, to the Western Isles or anything, which has always been a sort of, um, we had clearances in our area, but they happened earlier and they were less extreme. But the, one of the big things, as you say, is the confidence and ability of communities, and that's why the community land unit was so successful. Um, and now that there are more communities, because originally, um, you know, I've been involved in rural development actively since um, certainly the early 80s. And I remember rural forums, sort of first ever visit to um, our part of the world, and they, they struggled to find somewhere to visit. But in a sense, my perception is that certainly in rural areas, up every Stratham Glen, there is something, but not every community is at that stage. I mean, a community needs to start by functioning as a community. So you, you, you need to have a community body. You, you need to have a, um, a, um, somewhere to meet as a community. And, and so some communities have gone further than others, but the, the land values are obviously a major obstacle. And, and it's, you know, the, high, the whole estate buyout is, is very much a product of the circumstances in, in the Northwest and, and is not a phenomenon that is likely to be repeated widely in terms of buying whole mixed estates because of land values and other factors. Well, I appreciate what you're saying about land values, which I think is a very important point, if I may say so. Um, it has been said to me by some that there is little appetite for um, community purchase of land in South Scotland, which I represent, which is obviously a very large area with a lot of rural communities in it. And I wonder the degree to which that is um, an awareness issue, the possibilities. If I give you a quick um, example, uh, as a committee, we went to gear and understood that before people had been to egg to find out what the possibilities were and were supported by high which um, has a different remit as you've highlighted robin um, before they went there they weren't really aware and indeed by their own admission not necessarily confident about going forward and i wonder the degree to which um, the lack of that support in south scotland and the lack of knowledge is a factor oh, sure. i think that i was speaking to to pip Tabor yesterday, and and uh, uh, and he was talking about the Ettrick Valley again, where there has been a lot of intensive work there with the community, and we met the the um, the, the development officer from from that project as well, uh, and and undoubtedly, I mean, it was his view that the uh, you know making people aware that these possibilities exist is a large part of the picture, and giving them the confidence, yeah. and that requires support. It is not easy. Um, even in modest things to, and you know, there's always the question that, uh, you know, even where does the money come to, to um, in a sense, get your bid together or anything, even for small scale purchases. And um, my community uh, where I live in Burst Parish has been particularly involved in forestry, mm -hmm. which is a particularly suited land resource for communities to, uh, to, to use. And could I just, uh, sorry. Wait, sorry. Yeah. If I could just um, talk about, uh, you know, another two of the people who are on our committee, John Watt um, <coughs> has got extensive experience from high of the kinds of support which are available. He's also on the Scotland Committee for the Lottery. Uh, and uh, Ian Cook with DTAS is, is uh, well into uh, hands-on experience of how communities can be encouraged and supported and, uh, and resourced to take this on. So I think that the, there is the information there and the, the hands-on experience to, to try and do something about that. And, and just to follow on, on in, a, in a lateral sense, I see that one of your work streams is about community energy um, and that that had come up in your evidence previously in the first um, part of your remit. And I wonder, having had experience, as I think a number of us have as MSPs, about concerns about the ownership of energy, um, the degree to which um, you will be able to take that forward. I wonder if you could say something about that and how you see that work stream progressing. I think that work stream, as it was, as it was outlined, was seen in the context of the kinds of support communities were, were needing. And uh, it was in that context as much as anything else that it was being um, uh, proposed. But again, as we've been saying before, um, I, I would certainly hope that that's, that will not be lost as we're going forward and it will take its place in the, in the wider framework. 
Okay. Um, and uh, Claire Baker next, I think. Oh, sorry, pardon me, just before you do, um, a supplementary, I forgot about, excuse me, Alex. Very south, um, south of Scotland. Uh, indeed, south of Scotland. Uh, so that very topic I wanted just to raise very briefly, <laughs> convener. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Elitage, I think you may recall when we first met, and uh, I, I said that one of my real desires was to see community, the, the benefits of community ownership more widely spread through the south of Scotland. I represent Galloway in the southwest, and I'm delighted to say since then we've had a very successful buyout from the... Um, the Mull of Galloway Trust, which has been a, a very successful one. And what, what I just wondered if you, if there is any comment you want to make, because it struck me that where, as, as Mr. Callender said, where you have a community that really acts as a community and they have the desire to do so, clearly um, the Trust is a, is a perfect example of how they can take forward the purchase of, of the land that they're interested in. But I, I, I do think it, this needs to be a bottom-up driven thing with the responsibility, perhaps, of, of Parliament and Government to make sure that people are aware of the possibilities that do exist. If I can put it in an old-fashioned expression, you know, you can take the horse to water, but you can't make it drink, but you have to make the horse know where the water exists. And w would you agree with that in general, that there is a responsibility of, of, of the responsibility of Government in this regard should really be to make people absolutely aware of the possibilities that exist, but to a certain extent you have to leave it to the communities to act as a community and, and have the desire to take it forward? Absolutely, the government and, and the various agencies which it has uh, who are uh, taking and, and, and also voluntary organisations who are keen to uh, explore and, and uh, uh, share their own experience, like Community Land Scotland, for example. They're very keen to, to uh, ensure that they, they, they can talk to new communities who haven't thought of this before. But I think your, your main point about, uh, about the importance of um, there being a strong community there to begin with is, is very interesting because I was interested when we started looking at uh, these uh, community buyouts how often um, there had been a, a, a previous uh, cause that people had come round um, and there was already a steering group in existence before the question of uh, buying out the community land came up. Um, and that, that was that pattern seemed to, to exist in, in lots of different places. So um, whether, you, whether you can just go in cold and say, hey, you know, how about buying this, this, uh, this piece of land uh, is, I think, a moot point because it, it seems to work most naturally when there's already a head of steam about people having a vision for their own community. And then, you know, the, the, out of that vision comes a, a desire for ownership. Okay. Or may do. And, and also, the, of course, the point is, uh, your, your bottom-up point is, is, is exactly right, because if you're talking about empowering communities and making them more resilient, you don't say this is the way you should be empowered. It's for them to make that decision. Thank you. As a small follow-up to that, I wonder if you might consider the interesting phenomenon whereby the Scottish Land Fund provided quite a lot of the money for the Muller Galloway Trust to pay to another government body this in this case, the Northern Lighthouse Board, which is a, a re reserved function. Uh, and that indeed, it's a bit like swapping money around between departments. Wouldn't it have been easier if uh, they had just given it away? Well, transfer of public land is a, is a big issue, and Robin um, knows that. Yes. The, right from the issue of Crown land, down through various guises of Scottish Government land, down through local authority community asset transfers as a society we should be clear what resources we want held in which ways at in a sense what levels of community if i can put it that you know community of the realm you know the the, the community represented by this parliament um, and and um, the question of transfers state aid rules treasury rules in certain conditions is something that the group will aspire to analyze and comment on Good luck. <laughs> thank you. Um, Claire Baker. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, in the last few weeks, the Scottish Government have set a target of uh, one million acres to be in community ownership by 2020, which I think the First Minister described as a symbolic um, announcement at the time, but I might be incorrect in that. Um, is it now an aim of the group to think about how do we achieve that? And do you think it's an ambitious target? Do you think it's an achievable target? You talked about land values. I mean, what, how, I mean, it sounds like a grand target, but 
Have you done any analysis of how that will be delivered? I think it doubles well, the amount of ownership that is at the moment. What, what, what I mentioned by way of, of the discussion is um, the... Um, so what were the 500? You know, in the sense at the moment, the 500 are, um, in a sense, an acreage that I think comes from Community Land Scotland's membership. Um, there are many communities, including the one I live in, which own land who haven't become members of Community Land Scotland. So the question is, what's one measuring and how can one measure it satisfactorily going forward? Um, and you'll be aware that, in a sense, um, there are a number of aspects that, um, in a sense, as a society, we haven't been good at measuring in some senses. I mean, I don't mean the sort of who owns Scotland level, but there are questions about land registration and information about owners um, that are important to communities, they're important to businesses, they're important to public sector utilities and all, all, all the rest sort of thing. And, and similarly, in, in, in this situation, we'll be looking for robust information so, so that the... I personally take, take the target as an aspiration of that it's a statement that it is good to increase community ownership and it is good to analyse how we're going to get there and, and that will be a consideration of the group, not in the sense that it's the group's responsibility to deliver that target, but if you spread out the types of community ownership, what we know about how much there is before what potential one sees for, for different areas to be promoted and developed. Because in a sense, um, in terms of you take the land value um, point, one could almost say that every, you know, as you move away from the, the, the northwest, each acre is costing more. And within the target, um, do you think there is an aim to change private ownership in particular? Is that, uh, is that something that we should be looking to achieve or do you think that's irrelevant within, you talk about the diversity of ownership in terms of <laughs> local authority ownership or government ownership or currency ownership. I mean, do you see, I, the, did you see changing and increasing diversification of ownership in Scotland, part of that being how do we change some of the big, the, the ownership figures I quoted at the beginning, 432 owning 50% of the land, is that part of the aim of the group and look at when you look at the Scottish government's target of a million um, <coughs> acres by 2020 do you see those two things relating to each other is one a challenge to the other or are they completely you know but, but the the there's the analysis to be done if you see it I mean but I mean it's it's like private ownership is in the public interest mm -hmm. um, I don't know how many people here are private landowners you know I've got a house and three acres um, you know so, so I think we need to be careful of Categorise it. You know, there's a tendency to stereotype the whole thing when one writes about these things. When one says landowner, you know, the, you say it in a certain way um, in the documents, and, and like there's a sort of subtext that that's an estate owner. Um, or when you say community, there's a sort of notion of what a community is, and, and yet the communities in Scotland, urban and rural, are incredibly diverse. Um, there are a vast number of people who who own property, and there is a very concentrated pattern of private ownership and, and so one can't avoid posing questions about that. But I don't, you know, the, there are many routes to diversifying and creating. I mentioned social ownership and there are many forms rather than just equating the notion that it's community ownership, that is, it, it's just part of it, of how you have a, what might be called a, a more democratic pattern. And finally, um, are you going to be looking at international examples at the, of how they have achieved different patterns of land ownership? I think it's less a matter of looking at how they achieved them. Um, people will be familiar with the, the um, remarkable differences between the situation in Scotland and, and most European countries in terms of... Um, but the origins of that reflect deep, different historical differences. But what is very instructive um, is obviously when you go there, and many communities have and many other people have on other pretexts, is you see an extraordinary level of, of local control, um, not simply in a sense in, in owning land, but in the scale of responsibilities um, and, and 
revenue that is available and then the way localities cooperate to, in a sense, achieve bigger things together rather than being replaced by centralization. Could I make a comment about the, about the target, which is what you were, you were talking about? Um, uh, there is obviously always a danger with a target that you, you, um, you, you try to get, the, get to the target with a quick, fix, quick, uh, quick win. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I've heard it said that if you're going to get that target, then you should be concentrating on particular kinds of owners uh, and particular kinds of ownership in order to get there, uh, rather than saying what, what I, was very, I was very encouraged to hear the First Minister setting that target because it is seen as being a, an encouragement to communities to take this far, further and an endorsement of that uh, direction of travel. The irony presumably wouldn't be lost on those who were there at the time when he made it, that he did also mention, for example, the Ministry of Defence's large number of acres in Scotland as part of the picture. That's right. Um, Jim Hume. Uh, thanks very much. Um, yes, just again regarding that target of one million acres of community-owned land by 2020, um, to get somewhere you, uh, which is a target, uh, I think you have to know where you are at the moment. and. Mm -hmm. I just wonder, in your own views, and I think maybe Robin's already uh, explored that slightly, it's difficult to, to measure uh, what is community-owned land uh, at the present. Uh, uh, do either of you have a, a view of how much uh, community land is in, in, in uh, sorry, land is in community ownership at, at present, and how we would measure that, and how we could judge if we ever came to a target, or, or do we already have a million acres of land that's in community ownership and the, 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 the statement uh, doesn't mean anything? So I'd be interested in, in your views. Robust information. No robust information. Uh -huh. I don't think the statement doesn't mean anything because, as I say, I think it is an expression of an aspiration to, to increase community ownership. I mean, you may be aware that, for example, um, in the past, HI has, has had a look at some of this and, and at the same time, more recently, the Development Trust Association tried to accumulate information on, on assets, community assets, so buildings as well, you know, which for many communities it may be a building, but I mean that can be more profound than, than, than lots of acres in many situations. And, and uh, you know, so that uh, that should be built on in terms of giving more robust information because one of the, um, certainly um, you have the experience that DTS found and, and um, you also see it elsewhere in Europe that where they've done it more explicitly that actually when you add up some of the value of the sort of existing assets and Community Land Scotland have done this in part, but, but and um, what it, you start to see more significantly um, the rural communities acting in their own right as a significant value in the economy. Rural communities um, tend always to have been sort of seen as an an interest group rather than actual sort of sector of, of land use and, and involvement on their own account. Um, and that is helpful if they are recognized collectively because then it may increase more attention, more resources and a more systematic approach. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I would be correct in saying that Community Land Scotland uh, uh, estimates that uh, members of its organization actually control 500,000 acres of land. That's where I was suggesting, Convener, that the target came from doubling that. But, but their members, as you know, are, are, are a huge component, but only a component of community land ownership in Scotland. And of those who are members of that organisation? Yes. Because the North Asset Crofters Trust is not, for example, and that's another 20,000 and odd acres. Uh, so there, there's a need for more information, I guess about that. Uh, good. Um, I think we've had a good round of uh, discussion. Uh, it, it seems to me uh, people have explored the, this uh, first phase of your work, which I'm sure has been wide-ranging and, and um, uh, tempting to you to sort of uh, go down various avenues. But you've expressed the time you've got, you've got focus you've uh, got a time limit and it is part of the process so we very much welcome this uh, exchange of ideas and we'll try to have one fairly soon and we'd like to thank you both for giving evidence to us today very much 
Convener, before leaving, could could it, we um, s suggest that it might be helpful if uh, our special advisor uh, has has uh, uh, the opportunity to, to consult with the clerk or to this committee and keep us in in touch with with how you're progressing? Much indeed, yes. That that would be extremely helpful, um, given the the committee's agenda and its experience. Thank you very much for that. Well, thank you for that uh, uh, just now. I should uh, mention at the moment that uh, this is the last meeting of the committee for this term. And may I take this opportunity on behalf of uh, the committee to thank all those who have given evidence, both written and in person, and to our Cabinet Secretary Richard Lockhead, Minister Paul Wheelhouse and all our officials, all of whom have helped the committee greatly in its scrutiny of bills and other business. And may I also thank the official report, broadcasting, and clerks for their uh, huge amount of work to make sure that uh, the last term has worked well in detail and smoothly. The Rural Affairs Climate Change Environment Committee will convene again after the summer recess in September. Uh, you can keep up to date with this and other news regarding the committee on the committee web page and Twitter feed. So I close uh, the public part of this meeting and move into private and we'll take a five minute break. <laughs>